but you know, there's to me there's there's nothing like fresh garden grown corn. If you don't if you don't like fresh garden grown corn, you need to come to the altar. That's all I can say. You know, hallelujah, amen. Some something is not is not right there. Praise the Lord. But uh, it, yeah, that that all be coming up uh, sometime next month. If we don't get an um, early cold spell, then I'm, I'm hoping that we don't get an early cold spell. But uh, we've got quite a bit of vegetables that uh, we're going to be freezing, so we'll have some things throughout the winter um, of, uh, of our garden. And so we thank the Lord for that. It's a whole lot cheaper to raise it than it is to buy it there. So praise the Lord. Amen. Let's go and try to get off into this great word of the Lord and see what God has for us today. We're going to be in the book of First Chronicles, the 11th chapter of, of First Chronicles. Yeah, anytime, sir. So you, you, you can come while I'm preaching and put in money. Praise the Lord. First Chronicles chapter 11, and we're going to start in the fourth verse. First Chronicles chapter 11, starting in verse 4. And when you get that, if you can, please stand as we read the word of God. Praise the Lord. Y'all know the routine by now. Hallelujah. Amen. If you got it, shout amen. If you're not there, say wait for me. Praise the Lord. The heading of this is David Captures Zion which is the city of David or Jerusalem. It reads, And David and all Israel went to Jerusalem, which is Jabus, where the Jebusites, Jebusites were the inhabitants of the land. And the inhabitants of Jabus said to David, You shall not come hither. Nevertheless, David took the counsel of Zion, which is the city of David, verse 6, and David said, Whosoever smites the Jebusites first shall be chief and captain. So Joab, the son of Zuriah, went first up and was chief. And David dwelt in the castle. Therefore they called it the city of David. And he built the city round about, even from Milo round about. And Joab repaired the rest of the city. And I'll stop in verse 9. So David waxed greater and greater for the Lord of hosts was with him. David grew and multiplied and became great because the Lord of hosts was with him. And today I want to use as a subject, this battle belongs to the Lord. No matter what you are facing or going through or enduring or is on the horizon in your life, this battle belongs to the Lord. The devil may bark, he may bite, he may threaten, but he is a defeated foe because when Jesus hung on the cross and said it is finished, he meant that it is finished for the devil forever. So this battle belongs to the Lord. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we again are honored for this privilege and honor you have given us to come in your holy presence. And despite what the devil has said and what he's tried, what he's attempted to do, we are still here and able to hear what thus saith the Lord. I'm asking that you anoint our ears and our heart that we may hear and receive what the Spirit is saying. I'm asking that you anoint my lips of clay that I may rightly divide the word of truth. Let the preacher come out today. Let Jesus Christ be glorified, magnified, and praised. And we take authority over every attempt to hinder, to stall, to delay, to somehow circumvent the direction that the Holy Spirit wants us to go in, in the name of Jesus Christ. And Father, we're giving you the praise, we're giving the honor, and we're giving you the glory. And it's in the holy name of Jesus Christ we ask, and the whole church said, Amen. Praise the Lord. Before you sit down, turn around and look at somebody and say, enough is enough. And you will figure out exactly what I'm talking about later on in the message. Please be seated. We are living in very dynamic times. We're living in times where tomorrow could be 100% opposite of today. The influences and the effects of our society are taking its toll on every person on the planet. This is the first time in the recorded history of our society where kids as young as 8, 9, and 10 year olds are having nervous breakdowns. 
you would think at that age, what do they have to, to, to be concerned about that weighs on them so heavily? We're in times where it is trying men's souls. And that which we had confidence in maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago, we're finding out that it is not as stable as we thought. Society is changing. Leadership is changing. Things that we had planned for are somehow eroding before our very eyes. The family structure is being attacked as never before. Today it is easier for, for couples to, to somehow shack up together than to make that commitment that they're going to spend their life together. You're finding that we are now considering it to be the norm, quote unquote, for same sex to live together. I was disappointed when I read it yesterday, but Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger, the governor of California, has came out and publicly stated, publicly stated that he believes that it is okay for same-sex couples to live together. Our president, Barack Obama, has put his influence also behind the recognizing of same-sex marriages. And so we're building a generation of people that are illiterate to the ways of God. A dear lady was in a mall not too long ago and she was wearing a logo on her shirt, not a logo, but she's wearing lettering that she had on her t-shirt. And on it it said, live any way you want to live. God is dead. And those values are being sown in minds and hearts all around the world. It is breeding hopelessness. It is breeding despair. It is breeding a whole home what's the use attitude. And sadly, the church is faltering, failing, and stumbling as well. Because the church as a whole very little knows about the true moving of God's Spirit. The church knows about Sunday activities, Sunday performances, but as far as living for the Lord in your life 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, the church as a whole is illiterate to the ways of God. I was reading something in preparing for this message and I'm not saying that it shocked me, but it it's, it's sadden, saddens me because this is the state of our world. It says the state of the U.S. economy, and really as the U.S. goes, the whole world goes. The U.S. has that much sway and influence on the entirety of the world. I'm not laying this at the feet of our now president, Barack Obama, because he inherited a lot of stuff that has come from previous leadership. But at the same time, the course that he has chosen to take is in line with his predecessors. He has not deviated. In fact, he has accelerated many of the things that our previous leadership either ignored or rejected. It says the U.S. economy is in dire straits as 15 million Americans are unemployed and 18.9 million homes are in foreclosure. Every one of us either know or know of somebody who has lost their job or lost their home. The national deficit is set to hit the $11 trillion mark as well. These problems are compounded by the fact there exists a terrible breed of corruption in government, stealing and squandering billions in taxpayers' money. 
Maxine Waters, representative.